Good morning, Interweb, World Builders Log 26. Today, we are going to talk oceans. But first, we have a rather sizable amount of follow-up to do. So, point one. The poll from the last video was a total write-off. Recall I asked you all whether or not you wanted to see a sea topography video? Put it in a comment and I said, if you're a yay, hit the like button. If you're a nay, hit the dislike button. Now, I naively thought that much like with the dislikes on videos, YouTube would surface that information to me in YouTube studio, like on the back end. Turns out that's totally not a thing. YouTube will not display anywhere dislikes on comments, nor can I find an extension that would do that. So functionally, the whole poll was a write-off. So to the 620 odd people who voted, who I know voted, I'm really sorry. What we'll do going forward, and in hindsight, what I should have done was just put up a poll in the community tab. I'm going to work on the assumption that's a thing one can do. So yeah, I'm really sorry. But, but all is not lost. I went through the comments, tried to get a sort of vibe check from everyone. And it seemed to me that people were like, yeah, we'd go for a C topography video, but like, you know, this isn't where all the action's gonna happen, so like make it short, do a sort of highlights thing, hit the main points, quick demonstration, that sort of thing. So that's what I'm going to do. Stupid YouTube poll. <sighs> Disaster. Point number two. Lots of people left helpful tips about Blender in comments. Thank you very much. If I'm be honest though, a lot of it went straight over my head because I just do not know how to use Blender very well. So if you think there's a way I could streamline my Blender usage and or you can think of fun other things to do in Blender with respect to this map, will you please email me? I'll leave my email in the description or you can find it on the about page of the YouTube channel. Email me a sort of idiot proof, explain like I'm five, bullet pointed tutorial on how to get the thing done that you want me to do. Treat me like an absolute idiot because I know absolutely nothing about Blender. 100% of what I know is contained in the previous video. And to demonstrate this, I tried to put into effect some of the things people were saying, and I came up with this, where I took the topographic map, I made it grayscale, and then made a displacement map from it to get this kind of like exaggerated relief thing, which I think looks really cool, but I have no way of diagnosing the issues here or fixing the issues. Like I don't know what this tearing is about and how to get rid of it. I don't know how to make the land look, I don't know, I guess better, cleaner. Like I'd like each of these layers to kind of like staircase off. They're clean divides between each of these layers, but they're so not. And that kind of bugs me. I don't know how to deal with, with, with this weirdness up the top of the pole here, or there's this seam and I can't deal with that. So there's a bunch of things that I think people in comments were like, I will totally get it. I won't, I'm an idiot. Please email me and uh, I, I would love to learn. So that's point number two. Uh, point number three, the blending. Not, not this blending, but like topographic blending. So the state of play was this at the end of the last video, and I had said that I was unhappy with these planes, these vast flat planes, which in and of themselves aren't a problem. The issue was their elevation. Zero to 100 meters is a bit weird in that if there is a moderate amount of sea level rise, for example, like Esri, the, the, this continent here, with just like a third of it would be gone immediately. And that's not something we see on Earth. So I had said that I'd like to blend out the mountain range a little bit more. So I took this, the before, and I turned it into this, the after. Before, after, before, after. Janar still looks a bit pants in my opinion, but I think um, Esri, Degra, and Picard look baller. And I won't dwell on too much of what I was doing here, but functionally I was kind of thinking about it in two ways. One, it needs to look pretty, at least to my eyes. That's kind of the main thing I was after. It was an aesthetics thing. But two, I was trying to think in terms of like deposition and, or erosion and deposition. So the idea is that a bunch of material will get eroded from these mountains and it would like fall down the mountain and gather in this basin. So I tried to like taper out the basin to the shore. Same thing over here, same thing here, etc. That's kind of my, my thought process. But really it was just more of the same, draw squiggly lines. So is that follow-up done? I think that's follow-up done. Oh my God, follow-up done. Let's talk oceans. Specifically, let's figure out how to turn this gray void into something more like this. So the first thing I did was try and figure out the depth of my ocean. Now in comments, people were kind of stoked about calculating the depth uh, of the ocean. 
I, I'm going to let you down here. I don't do that. I basically just assume that my oceans are always exactly like Earth, plus or minus a little bit. Why? Because like ocean depth or sea level rise or fall is extremely hard to compute. You can see here, you just need all of these variables and you have to equate them all together. It's just really complicated. And like in terms of world building, just stuff that is too cumbersome to try and figure out. Like how much does the salinity of the the uh, the water, con the seawater contribute to relative sea level rise or fall? Or how much does the heat of the water contribute to sea level rise or fall? These are so esoteric, it's not really worth trying to crunch the numbers on it. So I go into G-plates and I look at the, roughly say the last 50 million years of my world. So that's about maybe here. And I try and keep an eye out for um, collisional events, major collisional events and major rifting events. So I can see here that Picard is going to form. So we got a collisional event occurring here. And then after that collision of event concludes, basically immediately after a rifting event opens up here that will eventually split Janar in two. And then we get into our modern world. Basic rule of thumb here is that if there's a major collisional event, we expect the sea levels to fall. If there's a major rifting event, we'd expect them to rise. And if there's like neither really any great collisional or rifting event, I usually just assume it's exactly like Earth. So here we had, again, we had this collisional event down here with Janar, which caused sea levels to fall. And then we have this major rifting event that's breaking apart. Sorry, not this, this is Picard, sorry, this is Janner. We have this major rifting event that uh, is going to pull apart Janner, and that will cause sea level to rise. So I figured a fall plus a rise cancel itself out. My oceans are functionally just exactly like Earth. That is to say, on average, they're about 4.5 uh, kilometers deep. That's the average depth of the abyssal plane. Now, maybe on your world, there is cause to have the uh, oceans rise or fall. And the natural question to ask is how much should they rise or fall by? And for that, again, I don't do any computation because it's really complicated, too complicated for what it's worth. I just look at the uh, sea level change over time. This is a great chart from Wikipedia, links in the description. It's about half a billion years of uh, sea level change here. And we'll see that it really doesn't vary by a whole lot. So if there's major rifting, I would go plus 150, 200, 250, something like that maybe. Major collision, I would go minus 50, minus 100, something like that. Very small variance away from, from modern day Earth, but enough to introduce some variability based on the sort of um, geographic reality of your world. Okay, so that's sea level established. Now, next, what I would advocate doing, but something I completely forgot to do when I was making my uh, sea topography, is I would again go into G plates and I would click on the ocean crust layer that is color coded for age. Quick recap, um, follows the color of the rainbow from red through to pink in order, red being the youngest crust, pink being the oldest crust. In general, in general, the younger the crust, the higher up it is, the older the crust, the lower down it is. So for example, here we have a mid-ocean ridge here. We ex It's pushing up a mountain chain. So we'd expect elevated crust here or elevated seafloor here. And as we go away from the ridge, the crust gets older and older. So we'd expect to for it to taper down into our continents. Same thing here and same thing over here. The more towards the blues and violets it goes, the lower, the deeper the ocean. Again, in general, because if you note here pink, Pink is the oldest section of ocean crust uh, on my world, but you'll note that it occurs here in this sea in Janar. It occurs here in Esri and down here in Picard. All three of these instances are functionally enclosed spaces. So you can see here that this section here, it's basically like the Sea of Japan. It's functionally just cut off from the open ocean. So therefore I'd expect the load of deposition to occur and that would kind of like raise up the levels there and I did the same thing here because again it's kind of functionally cut off there's like a little narrow little inlet here and the same thing over here so despite these areas of crust being the oldest their depth is elevated due to deposition so red young crust depth quite high towards the violet old crust depth quite low in enclosed spaces you can violate that sort of binary and also, look at Earth. That's a big thing about gauging depth. Just look at what Earth's doing. So with all that done, that's kind of like step 
one and two, I guess. Step three is to assign some hard numbers and make a color ramp. And that's what I did here. This is a standard sort of elevation spread for Earth's oceans. Literally, I lifted this from my reference atlas, the Times Atlas of the World. Here is the height in meters. Here is some kind of like indicative structures that are exemplars of this step. You'll see what I mean by this in a second. It's just a way of me orientating myself. Not going to dwell too much on this for the moment, but the one thing I will point out is you might think it's a bit odd that our first elevation step is between zero and 200 meters. And then the next one is from 200 to 2000 meters. Surely we're losing an awful lot of detail there and we'd want more elevations. Sort of counterintuitively, you really don't because Earth's ocean, and by extension, I'm going to assume most oceans, functionally has two levels. It has a shelf level, the continental shelf level, which on Earth has an average of about like 120 meters is a decent-ish sort of figure for it. And it has an abyssal plane level, which is about four and a half thousand meters on average. So all other elevations as a sort of percentage of the surface area of the oceans don't really count for too much. So to grossly oversimplify things, you can kind of think of Earth's oceans as being like this, where you have a shelf layer and then you have like an abyssal plane layer and then this section here, all this elevation spread, basically accounts for almost nothing. Hence why you'll find in atlases this sort of like kind of weird um, elevation spread. And conversely, on the other side, you probably heard that the Mariana Trench is about 10k uh, deep, 10 kilometers deep. We're only going as far as 6,000 here because between 6 and 10, basically none of the ocean is at that depth. It's literally all just contained within trenches. No need to have detail there. So I would recommend following this spread, plus or minus a bit, depending on what your uh, planet is doing, or e rifting and collisions, etc. Okay, and finally, before we analyze the map, let's talk some features, uh, where they are, what to do with them, etc. Basically, where do the mid-ocean ridges go? Where do trenches go? What do they look like? What to do with hotspots? large igneous provinces, etc. So, mid-ocean ridges. Shock horror occur at divergent boundaries. Example, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. They're basically thin-ish underwater mountain chains that have a sort of valley at their crest, and they gently taper down to the abyssal plain. Pick up an atlas, look at how the mid-ocean ridge is marked in in this style. Trenches. Shock horror, like the Mariana Trench, uh, occur at convergent boundaries, at subduction zones. Functionally, they're underwater cliffs made by the plate being subducted. The kind of key thing for me to understand is how wide they are. So on Earth, they're between about 50 and 100 kilometers in width. That's a useful stat to know for penciling them in in an atlas or in an atlas style world map. Hotspots. One of the things that used to trip me up the whole time was how deep should my hotspots, or specifically the trail of uh, sea mounts left in the wake of a hotspot, how deep should they be? My rule of thumb here is that between 0 and 80 million years old, if the sea mounts are between 0 and 80 million years old, they should be greater than 2,000 meters. Their depth should be greater than 2,000 meters. If they're older than that, they transition down and eventually merge with the abyssal plane. And I am pulling those figures here from the Meiji Seamount, named after the uh, Meiji Emperor of Japan. This here is, this is Hawaii, and this whole structure here is called the Hawaii Emperor Chain. It's a really long chain of islands and seamounts, etc. The Meiji Seamount occurs somewhere up the north here. Oh, and I should state where Hawaii is, that's where the hotspot is, that's where young crustal material is being formed. Up where the Meiji Seamount is, that, that is extremely old. It is 82 million years old. And we'll see, even at that age, its depth is 2,000 meters. So I'm using that as my kind of midpoint. Younger than 80 million years, it is going to be gradually increase from 2,000. Older than 80 million years, it's going to gradually, the seamounts are going to gradually decrease from 2,000. And working under that framework, it's yielded kind of decent looking results for me. So I'm, I'm happy with that. And finally, large igneous provinces. Recall in the G plates portion, I said something to the effect of, uh, we needn't bother marking in large igneous provinces in our oceans. Large igneous provinces pop off about, I think I said every 30 ish million years, but because there's so much more ocean than land, most of the time they're going to be in um in the ocean and because the action isn't occurring in the ocean we just don't care i'm gonna walk that back i think next time around i'm going to mark in large igneous provinces in the ocean just because they provide sort of more intriguing uh, topography on the seafloor so what i did was uh, in lieu of that i just placed random large igneous provinces 
here and there, just when I felt the sea floor was getting a bit barren. Season two will do it in a more rigorous way in G-plates. The, the large English provinces, the underwater large English provinces, essentially they're like elevation wise, like mid-ocean ridges, except instead of being a ridge, their shock horror, like a plateau. And I'm thinking here, like the Krugelen, oh, come back to me, oh, where's it gone? Here we go. Like around the Krugelen, uh, Krugelen, Krugelen Islands here, like this sort of thing. Uh, I, as far as I know, this is a large English province and it just adds a nice bit of detail to the seafloor. And all of these little regions here, we could justify them as being kind of large English provinces. There's another one up in here, etc. More variety than just hotspots and mid-ocean ridges. So that's the run down there. All pretty simple. Again, not much going on with the seafloor. So uh, let us now do some analysis of our map to see these things in action. So first layer here, this is again between zero and 200 meters. This function is just going to be our shelf layer. Everything that's marked as continental shelf, that is continental crust that is submerged, will go in this layer. Super easy. In fact, I, I had the continental crust marked or had the continental shelf marked in G-plate. So I just basically traced it. Layer number two, this is uh, for depths between 200 and 2000 meters below sea level. The primary sort of thing that happens at this elevation is that we just transition away from the continental shelf. That's it. I've also added in areas here along my mid-ocean ridges, more elevated areas here. Again, for a bit of interest, I'm thinking this is like the Azores, basically. All of these regions are like these elevated regions, like, like this on our ridge. And note our young hotspots, younger than 80 million years, are, are beginning to get marked in at this elevation range. Or rather, not hotspots, young underwater seamounts are beginning to get marked in at this elevation range. Layer number three, this is the 2000 to 3000 meter range. The main thing that happens at this depth is that we see the, uh, like, I guess the tops of the mid-ocean ridges um, occur at this, this point. Basic shtick here was the younger the ridge, the less of it was. So recall that Janar is just being split in half. So I, I penciled in like a really faint looking ridge here, whereas we have more robust looking ridges along here. And of course, obviously, uh, at each point, you're transitioning away from the previous point. All right, and then we have layer number four. This is 3,000 to 4,000 meters. Again, it functions away from... Oh, I sorry, I forgot. There's a large English province up here. Look how cool. Adds a bit of interest. Uh, this layer is uh, three to 4,000 meters below sea level. This functions, again, like a transition away from what you already got, uh, and notably a transition away from the mid-ocean ridge, basically or mid-ocean ridges. Also note that I'm just throwing in, again, these random, I guess we could call them large against provinces, or just, I rather, I think I just call them anomalies at this stage, just to introduce a little bit of interest, pepper little dots here and there, again, just to make it uh, feel a little bit more, I guess, natural. Layer number five, this is uh, 4,000 to 5,000 meters below sea level. This is the open ocean layer. So this is kind of where the average abyssal plane depth would fall. So you want to make most of your oceans this layer, basically. And that's what I did here. I filled basically everything in. The only thing that remained was I carved out areas here that would act as like ocean basins. I did that functionally at random because I wasn't looking at my ocean uh, age map like an idiot, but you would do this based on ocean age. So for example, here, this is like quite an old section here going on here. So maybe I would be totally justified having a, a, um, a basin occur along here, for example. Please reference, don't be me. Please, please reference your, your age map. That would be really helpful. I am an idiot. Uh, do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> uh, so that is that one. Then the penultimate one is, um, this is layer is between 5,000 and 6,000 meters below sea level. This is our ocean deep. So all these basins that we carved in, I'm predominantly filling all of them in at this level. And I'm leaving a few little spots here for just like extra deep basins. And they'll get covered in the final layer, which is 6,000 meters plus. They're filled in, but predominantly what goes on with this layer is the filling in of trenches. So we see here, if we take off our ultimate layer, there is nothing put in there. And if we turn it on, that is marked in there. All right, and that is basically that. Like I'm not glossing over a bunch of information here. There isn't really 
that much to oceans, particularly because for most people, they're very much a background thing. They're not the area of most importance. You basically set yourself an average depth. You look at the age of your crust to gauge what parts of the ocean are deep, what parts aren't. Set up a color ramp uh, and elevations basically pull from earth plus or minus a few hundred meters and then basically just get drawing uh, but there in that last one is where the time really goes like it takes a long time to draw this and in fact actually i can tell you how long it's going to take hold on be right back okay here we go while i was drawing the oceans in i was listening to dan carlin's hardcore history supernova in the east great series for anyone who enjoys military history uh, i listened to four and a half episodes it took me four and a half episodes to make the oceans. So what's that? That's a 4.5 plus 4 is 8.5 plus 5 is 13.5 plus 4 is 17.5 plus 3.5 is 21, if my math is correct. We'll say plus another hour or two um, in case I ever paused it for a bit to think, etc. So a bit between 21 and 24 hours were dedicated to, to, to this. Uh, which, Jesus, when I say that, that's really, that's a long time. <laughs> but here we are, folks. My, my, my trek down madness, it continues. Um, right, oceans done. Uh, what are we going to do next time? Oh, I think what we're going to do next time, now that we have our oceans done, I think we should look at tides. Let's figure out what our tides are doing. Um, what areas get normal tides, what areas get weird tides, what areas don't get tides, etc. Um, let's do that and then we'll talk climate. All right. I hope you enjoyed, folks. Thank you so much for watching. On screen now is some sort of really nice animation of this world. I hope you enjoy that too. And yeah, until next time, Edgar out.